Did you know that the Gardener's Workshop offers cut flower seeds? Our hand-picked selection includes only the varieties we grow in our own fields and gardens, and each pack is printed with our exclusive growing tips and insights. So visit us at thegardenersworkshop.com today. The Gardener's Workshop, turning all thumbs green. Hey friends, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your friend in flowers and more, as you'll learn today, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And I am joined here today with longtime friend and team member, Rhonda Graves. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, Lisa. And so we're actually sitting together recording this, which this doesn't normally happen. Um, so it'll be a lot of fun. Um, Rhonda and I are both experienced bug huggers, and that means that we have embraced how significantly important insects are and how much they help us. Although, unfortunately, people tend to focus in on the few that cause a problem, but there's so many other great ones. Um, so, Rhonda, it's great to have you here. I think we've we've done several bug talks. Yes, we have. Um, and today's a bigger picture than the bug talk. We're going to talk today about kind of restoring nature. I allude to that often in my talks about how since I restored the natural order here on my farm, that allowed me to really walk away from using pesticides with confidence. It's not quick, but with confidence. And um, Rhonda's done the very same thing. She has a, a yard and a garden and a home, um, and I've done it a little bit bigger. So we thought we'd talk today about those important things Um why it's important, what we're talking about, and then just some resources and how do you do it? What do you think? Well, they're they're just so fun to look at too. They're interesting to watch. It's and if you true. stop, go out every morning, look in your garden, see what's moving around yeah, and uh, just see what they're doing and see if they're helping you or maybe they are hurting you, but are they doing so much damage that you have to like pull out the big guns and Right. And take care of everyone that's out there, even the innocent guys. True. And isn't it true that there's probably, if you give them time, somebody's going to come along and get him. Right. Like one of those assassin bugs. Oh, like yeah. Real yeah. Bugs. Oh, my gosh. Oh. You know, it's so funny that um, one of our other good friends who also helps us from time to time, Susan Ackerman, will often report, she's often the worship leader at church, and she'll say, Robbie and I go out with our coffee. In more on mornings that it's pleasant. And she said, like two hours later, we come out of the garden because they're just kind of inventorying all the creatures that they embrace out there. And I mean, friends, I just can't even tell you if you love gardening or you love farming, there's a whole deeper level, right? Well, I, yeah, it's a whole world for sure. And they all have a part in it. And I think, as you said, there are only like 2% of the insects that are out there, which there are a whole lot more of them than there are of us. Um, the only 2% of them are actually considered pests and do monetary damage or health right. damage, things like that. So I think a lot of um, insects fall victim to being an inconvenience. They're at, in the wrong place it's at the wrong time, time you know, um, and once you explore and understand just how beneficial insects are, um, you know, as I mentioned that on here on our farm, um, we don't use pesticides anymore. I haven't for, gosh, I used to say over a decade. I'm sure it's probably coming close to two decades now. Not even organic stuff, typically, um, because we don't find that we need to. And for me in the big picture, and I'll just talk a little bit about doing it here on my farm. It's not just walking away from the trigger, which means the spray bottle, y'all, you know, just making a pack with yourself um, and say for two years, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and no, your your insects, your pests, the things that you think are pests, don't just magically disappear. Um, but with time um, and following just some general ground rules, and for me, that would be here on our flower farm. There's just certain flowers that are bug magnets, pest magnets, mm -hmm. that we just don't grow anymore, like Shasta daisies, mm -hmm. gladiolas. Those are two flowers that here in my region, mid the mid-Atlantic of the United States, um, attract thrips. I just could never get a control on thrips while I grew those flowers. We eliminated those flowers, and within two years, um, 
we still have a low grade thrip presence, mm-hmm. but it's not an issue, you know? Right. So it's not just stopping using pesticides. You look at your practices and some of the stuff you're growing. You know, if you have a pesky, if you have a plant, that is really pesty and you can't bear it because I know that you're probably already thinking, but you know, there's nothing wrong with aphids on butterfly weed, right? Right. Well, one good thing about aphids on butterfly weed or anything is that they're just a luncheon for like the lady beetles and all those other surfed flies, all the things that eat them. Hey, that's how you attract them in your garden is to actually have a little bit of pest so yeah, that exactly. there's food there for them to come and there's nectar. And that's one thing I think really makes a difference on your farm is that you have blooms so long during the year. I mean, they have no reason to leave because right. it's good here. And, you know, um, that's kind of what spurred the book, Vegetables Love Flowers. That book, y'all, is not about vegetables. It's about how significant the presence of flowers in a vegetable patch can be and how to do that. And we did it with a cutting garden. So that's a really good point, Rhonda, that we roll out the red carpet. Mm -hmm. And I also think that one of the reasons that we have such a, I mean, my goodness, you could go out in this garden and stay out there all day and just never even capture looking at half of what's going on out there. Um, But I feel like because we grow so many cool season hardy annuals, which are cool flowers, which bloom early in the season, like right now, this is late March, we're recording this. There's calendula out there already blooming. Um, There's Sorinthi already out there blooming. And there's Sweet William just starting, one of the varieties. Um, And you think about what else is blooming in the world. There are, we have a lot of dandelions Mm -hmm. around here. We love dandelions. Henbit. And henbit, (laughs) yeah. But having flowers early in the season attracts these good creatures. And they say, you know, let's go over there. Well, then we just feed them constantly through all these flowers and they never want to leave because it's really dangerous for them to leave. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know know I'm thinking about the early nectar and there, cause there are, I know I always talk to you about parasitic wasps. Oh, I love them. (laughs) But they're also teeny tiny. Most of them are teeny tiny. Like the one that parasitizes the tobacco horn. Right. Um, you probably wouldn't even notice it being around, but it's those little, little wasps and little flies that parasitize um, some of those pests that um, those, those nectar plants really attract. So we're talking about, so those are like not the wasps that people are so terrified of, which after we get through with you today, you aren't going to be so terrified of. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is a different family of mm-hmm. wasps, right? Mm-hmm. Those little teeny ones. Um, But friends, what we really want you to take away from listening to us chat about what we love to talk about and how we have restored the natural order in our homes and gardens and and on this farm um, is that the whole system is made pretty perfectly to work together. It's when we interfere or have interfered that breaks that chain, Mm -hmm. Um, which brings me to my first book suggestion. First off, um, I think it's easy, I believe, for people to get overwhelmed when they start learning about this because there are so many great resources. That's true. You yeah. have to really just, and if I had to only recommend one book, if, all right, think about what yours would okay. be. My one book would be Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. Um, if you, anybody that just even owns a home should have this book. Um, this book, I guess, when was this book published? I think I saw 2007. I was going to say, I read okay. this book about 10 years ago for the first time. And it literally is what started my journey of really changing the way that I farm and think about, not in my cutting garden, but everything else around it and some of the practices. But this is a really great book for the home gardener right up to the grower. The basics of, because I think of it as a chain. There's this chain of every chain, every link in the chain is super important at one point in time. And when there's missing links, and there are a lot of missing links now, y'all. I mean, I just, I just can't believe we're still surviving, frankly. (laughs) When you start learning about 
how amazing the system nature is and how, what it does for you. Um, and you see how we've just eliminated so much of it out of fear and inconvenience and ignorance. Mm -hmm. I know that was my greed and greed. Yeah. <laughs> all of those things. Um, just really. So that would be my pick bringing nature home by Doug Tallamy. Um, and we'll have a show in the show notes below. We'll give a link to that. So if somebody had to start with one, what would you recommend? I do like uh, Mary Gardner's uh, Good Garden Bugs, Everything You Need to Know About um, Beneficial Predatory Insects. Mm -hmm. So that's like, you know, you don't think of a lady beetle being a predatory insect, but she is. She is. <laughs> um, uh, as an adult and as a, as a larvae too. Yeah. So, um, but there's so many other ones out there, you know, spiders. I know everybody. Oh my out. gosh. I um, love spiders now. Yeah. So spiders and manids, you know, the big ones, you know, but there's so many little ones that uh, just do such an important job with pests. And, you know, let's just talk about some of those scary ones. So wasps and spiders are two that are some of the most I have now learned and have such respect, and I'm so pleased to have them guests on my farm, are wasps and mm -hmm. spiders. They're some of the most ferocious eaters mm -hmm. of bad bugs. Um, and so two just great examples of that. One is, you know, when I was tilling the garden, when you till a garden on a big, on a tractor, you go really slow. And that, because I have a small tractor, I'm often tilling between two beds on either side that are still producing. And I happen to be tilling, there's a bed of tomatoes, a whole, you know, hundred foot row of tomatoes. This was several years ago and you're going really slow. And I'm watching this wasp. He was, I couldn't see from a distance yet what he had, but he was hopping, literally flying from tomato cage post to post. And when I got closer, I could see what he was doing. He had a tobacco horn worm, mm -hmm. which is that big worm that gets on your tomatoes, y'all, that big green guy that eats your plants quickly. Mm -hmm. That wasp was carrying that horn worm, um, and it was so heavy, he was <laughs> having to literally touch down. Oh, that's great. He couldn't make it back, and the worm was dead. He had st well, it was stunned, I guess. He had stung the worm and was carrying it back to his hole, to stuff it in is what I understand right. for his babies or her babies. Her babies. <laughs> yes, that's right. Her babies. She, they're, they, the she's are probably the ones that are doing most of the work. I don't know. Well, anyway, and the bees and wasp family anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really true. And so after I, that I investigated mm -hmm. and then I learned wasps are meat eaters. They mm -hmm. eat other insects primarily right. and that, why would I not want them in my garden to eat other insects? Mm -hmm. They eat so many caterpillars. They take care of um, the larva of the moth that gets on all of our buds out here mm -hmm. on the sunflowers. Um, so I have a new respect. So I cohabitate with wasps now. We just watch out for each other and they do a lot of hard work around here. Right. And um, spiders are pretty important too, aren't they? Oh yeah. They eat a, they eat a lot of, a lot of insects. So, and <laughs> I do have them in the house occasionally, but yeah, me too. Yeah, I have my bug containment system. So, oh my gosh, y'all, tell us about. We have a bug <laughs> containment system at the Gardener's Workshop Warehouse. Tell them what that is, Rhonda. It's basically two small, clear plastic cups <laughs> marked "Bug con TGW <laughs> Containment Bug Containment Center." So, I mean, system and we just can pick up an insect whatever it's usually the beetles running through yeah yeah the warehouse or a cricket or a spider they always yell and so i go get it and we relocate it outside so yeah. born free that's right that's right and you know so when you start to understand that every insect plays a role they're either there to be eaten or they're the eater right of somebody mm -hmm. right wow that is pretty dadgum um, significant. So let's just talk about what are some of the things you've done in your yard to help restore the natural order? I know you plant a lot of native stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, native plants. Um, and there are a lot of a lot of the bees, uh, especially that are, you know, honeybees are generalists. They will 
take nectar anywhere, but there are a lot of bees that specialize on a certain plant. And if that certain plant can't be found, it's kind of like monarchs and milkweed. Um, it's their chance of survival is, you know, is, is lessened. Right. So, and there's some bees that are only out for, you know, a couple weeks at a time. Um, they get their job done and then they die off and their babies are born the next spring. So, but yeah, planting more, um, blooming, you know, more flowers, not using any chemicals. Um, just, uh, yeah, the natives are a big part of that. And, you know, you said not using chemicals. I mean, because we know that organic products do harm beneficial insects, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if it kills anybody, right. there's it's, it's potential to harm them. And so we just have really learned and proven that you really don't have to use chemicals. Right. You know, I mean, again, by crop selection, um, I mean, you know, if you've got a plant on your, in your garden, that is just a problem. You just don't know what to do. You need to dig it up and throw it away. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. why there are way too many strong growers, right. Exactly. That, that just really don't, um, that don't need all that attention. Um, and so Rhonda explain how native plants kind of support native insects, how that whole, and birds and how that whole cycle works. Cause I don't think, I think people mm-hmm. think like I did, Oh, native, that means they grow better here and I might not have to water them as much, but it is much deeper than oh, that. Oh, definitely. But that is true. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. plants that uh, have evolved here and then those insects that have co-evolved there. So um, if you go to the store and pick a plant that's you know, bug resistant or something like that. It might be something that actually came from the Far East and its predators or its, you know, pests are not here in this country. So there, you know, there are no bugs to eat it because the native bugs are eating the plants that they've been eating for millennia. Right. Um, But uh, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of those ornamental plants that are just, you know, they're real showy or whatever, they come from different parts of the world and we just don't have those those pests here. Yeah. Now there's th- yet exactly. I mean, there's certainly insects and plants that get introduced here on purpose or by accident. In the case of uh, a lot of the insects, well, actually, some of those might have been introduced or purposely, purposely too. By, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they get introduced here, and uh, sometimes they can become a big problem. So. Um, like Japanese beetles. Um, right. Oh, yeah. They've, they've uh, gotten to be quite a problem. And there's no, they don't have predators because they're not they're, native. They're not native. So their predators are still somewhere else. So, um, but yeah. when you grow native plants, that attracts native insects. And then that also attracts and provides food for our native birds, right? Correct. Yeah. And we've lost a lot of songbirds. And that's one thing that, Doug Tallamy was really into. He's an entomologist in, I think, a, in Delaware. Um, and that yeah. was his study, just to look at that relationship between the insects and the native plants, what you would find on a plant that had been here for, you know, a, a native plant versus one that's uh, a non-native that doesn't have any pest at all. Um, but another thing about those, when you think about um, like a butterfly weed or something like that, uh, monarch butterflies they're going to lay their eggs on that plant because that's what that's their host plant their babies are going to eat that plant well most people love monarchs and think that's great let's you know it's okay for them to eat that particular plant but there are lots of other other insects that their host plant is something else that you might not really want them to eat but it is it is part of nature it's part of nature and it's and if you find out more about it, it might be something that, oh, that's a beautiful exactly. butterfly or a beautiful moth that eats. And do they really eat that much? Right. Um, that's another thing is having diversity. Right. Um, you have a lot of diversity here. So, um, you know, places that have just crepe myrtles or just azaleas or whatever, right. when a pest comes in. It wipes yeah, you out. Yeah. So. And, you know, that's so true. It's like there are so many other insects that do that same cycle Mm -hmm. kind of as monarchs do that people get so, but they aren't as showy as a monarch. Mm -hmm. That's again, that's like the headliner insect Mm -hmm. for so many others. 
um, because there are some super cool moths. Oh yeah, definitely. And people squash those caterpillars without thinking twice. And that's, I mean, it's okay for, a, but you have to leave some, mm -hmm. you know, you have, and, it, and it's bird, it's bird food, caterpillar. It's bird food. And, yep. Yeah. Calamy says that too, is that, uh, a uh, caterpillar is like the best protein you can feed your baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's soft, it's squishy, it'll go down their little throats really <laughs> fast, and it feeds them. <laughs> that is pretty daggone good. I just love Doug Tallamy. Great. You know, I mean, it just, it was like a aha moment. I just never understood that the reason that we should, and, and what I took away from his book, Bringing Nature Home, one of the things is, the three most important plants that you could that I could plant here on my farm to make the biggest impact were oak trees, mm -hmm. southern wax myrtles, and Virginia creeper. Hmm. I already had a ton of Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper, that's one. It's got oh gosh, what's the name? It's one of the it's got a beautiful moth that feeds on it. Oh that wow. gets host plant. And Japanese beetles feed on it oh, too. Really? Big time. Oh, oh yeah. And that's better that they eat on that than yeah. something else, yep. right? <laughs> um, it's true, but it was like, so for me, just to tell you how I applied this theory or the truth about restoring nature, about how you can really do it, is you don't have to say, all right, I'm cutting down my whole yard. It's when you go to add or add a new plant, a tree or a shrub, or you're going to renovate a little bed or something, consider bring in natives in mm -hmm. because when you bring in native plants that brings in native insects and those native insects are the food for our native birds. And, you know, I grew up in a burden home. Um, the Mitchells lived down the street from us. They were really, they wrote books about birds and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just found one. When I was just going through when we were, as we're moving Maybe stuff books. around. Yeah. And the books and um, you know, we don't see Baltimore Orioles here. I don't see them hardly at all. Mm -hmm. They were at my mother's feeder every morning wow. for toast with jelly. <laughs> I was there too. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, and I think back, I mean, we had a real diverse landscape, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't very big though. Um, but I think people just don't get it. I didn't get it. I was a farmer for 10 years and didn't really mm -hmm. get it. Um, and then it trickles down, you know, to frogs and turtles. And I mean, it's so deep, y'all. Snakes. Oh, yeah. I just saw that. Joey. <laughs> Joey. That's what we I'm call. A, I'm not a huge snake fan. I'm I'm not a snake fan at all, but I know how important they are. And I just saw on a you know neighborhood post, it's like, how do I keep snakes away? That so was all it's like this, that, the other thing. And somebody says, you know. To just let them be. They'll go away when the food source is gone. And who really wants mice running around? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or, or moles. Everybody wants to know how to get rid of moles and bulls. En encourage snakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's great. So the, here's how we handle the snakes here on our farm. Because I'm not really a snake fan either. However, snakes cured our major vole problem mm -hmm. a decade ago. Um, and we have a couple black snakes that are here on the farm and we tend to make rock piles. There's a, I'm just thinking there's two here on the farm. Those are like safe havens mm -hmm. for reptiles. Um, and so nobody wants to be startled by a snake, right? Mm -hmm. So we've named, all of our snakes are named Joey because Joey's a sweet boy that we knew. <laughs> um, and it's a cute name. Mm -hmm. So instead of screaming, you just scream, Joey, and it mm -hmm. kind of calms you down. And it has helped us get mm -hmm. over our snake fears um, because it, I mean, it's, what's one of the most number one things this time of the year people are complaining about? Voles. We have, oh, yeah. Um, and let me tell you, you don't want any more voles? Encourage a couple of snakes to hang out. They don't want to bite you. They want, you know, rodents. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want them to actually have. Um so yeah, snakes are pretty amazing. And then how about, so we're, we're talking about nature at levels, right? We're talking about these ground insects and then planting some native stuff. And then the birds that come to those native plants, these songbirds eat a boatload of insects when they've got babies, right? Oh, right. I, I, I can't remember how many. It's like thousands from the time that they're hatched to the time they leave the nest. Thousands. Did y'all yeah. hear that? <laughs> And so if they're living in your garden, 
I mean, I've read something about chickadees, you know, two mm -hmm. or 3,000 insects they collect to feed their little clutch of those little teeny babies. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, those are, you know, caterpillars, mm -hmm. aphids, all of that right. stuff, all of mm -hmm. that stuff. And so it's like when you step back and start learning. So if you read Doug's book, Bringing Nature Home, and he has several books, I would say this Bringing Nature Home is the base mm -hmm. book because um, they list, he lists plants in there by region um, here in the United States. Um, it will really just open your eyes to what is actually going on out there. And he now has uh, an organization. Apparently he started it with uh, just a, somebody who was inspired by his talk, heard him speak and and I think she's in marketing and she's like, you know, we've got to do something. We've got to make a difference and get people interested in changing their yard. So their organization is called homegrownnationalpark.org. And okay. if you go there, you can actually go to your region um, and look up the plants, those keystone plants that, you know, that start, with awesome. that, start with that one plant, you know, and right. next time you go to the, to the, uh, to the nursery. And that's another thing, thinking about nurseries, um, you know, for a while, you know, for a while, it'd be real hard to find anything at a nursery. Um, so look for native plants, native plants. Yeah. You can go find English ivy, which is not a real good choice. Or but, Japanese maples, yes. which aren't native at all. Right. Key is in the name, y'all. <laughs> so um, uh, finding those uh, nurseries that are now, there are a lot more of them because there's, there has been more demand. So it's, it is becoming more available. Um, through nurseries and then a lot of the master gardener groups when they have yeah. plant sales this time of year it's starting now I mean right end of April 1st of May you probably can't go very far without hitting a, a master gardener sale yeah. or native plant uh, society so and then places like I know here for us we have a place called the Virginia Living Museum mm -hmm. which is an amazing place but they have like a native plant nursery and right. have a big sale and um so there are definitely, you just have to seek them out. They aren't in big brick and mortar stores right. often, sometimes, but the smart brick and mortar nurseries are definitely adding native plants. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of states too that um, I know North Carolina had changed their law so that all the right-of-ways, uh, I don't know if it's still that way or not, but they made it so that all the right-of-ways would have native, you know, highways would right. have native plants in planning. So um, their department of transportation. And so they had a demand there, which helped all the people that are looking for plants. Exactly. So, so exactly. it is, it is happening. So, and you know, you, I under, as a retailer, I understand it's hard to sell natives when nobody know what they right. didn't know what they were, why they were beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a slow roll. It takes decades for all of that to change. And we, it's been going on now for several decades, right? right. So, um, yeah, so that is just pretty dadgum awesome. But um, I just want to say that um, one of the books that I read um, years ago called Grow Organic, I'm not even sure if it's in pub in um, print anymore, by Doug Oster and Jessica Walliser. And it said in there, all right, if you decide you want to give up drugs, it's going to take two years. Hmm. So this is not a quick turn. You know, if you say, I'm going to give up using chemical products today um, and then implement some of these other things and something we haven't even touched on. I mean, we could talk for days about <laughs> this. Um, another part of this is not only in your plant selection, natives being, you know, top dog, but um, is the growing conditions, planting the right plant in the right conditions, you know, planting a sun lover in the shade, that plant is going to struggle. And when a plant struggles mm -hmm. or is stressed, guess what, friends, they send up a red flag to the pests and disease that says, come and get me. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Yep. I mean, we know it is true. So growing healthier plants helps is another piece of all these pieces we're talking about. You know, so now you want me to talk about soil because that's my yes. next favorite yeah. thing yeah. in the world. There you go. So <laughs> and it all starts there, and you in never the soil. see those guys oh barely. There's so much going on in the soil and uh, so many beneficial things that are billions, in billions in a teaspoon. I mean, think. Did you hear what she just said billions in a teaspoon? Yeah, 
microbes in healthy soil. In healthy soil. And, you know, ever since they wrote this in teeming for microbes, it, it's liberated me to say it um, without, you know, too much fallout, is that using synthetic fertilizers, that's anything pelleted and blue, y'all. <laughs> um, and whenever you use a synthetic fertilizer on your lawn or in your garden, um, all those microbes are at risk because of the sodium that's mm -hmm. in the fertilizer. Has anybody ever put salt on a slug? Like when you were a kid or maybe with your grandkids, that's what the sodium in synthetic fertilizers does to these billions of little creatures living in our soil. It damages or kills them which in fact turns around and makes those plants 100% dependent on you mm -hmm. to provide all the care that those microbes were given to your plant roots. The roots is where it's at. Right. And all that organic material that's in there that helps keep water close by. Um, so you don't have runoff, you don't have erosion, um, you don't have to water every day. Mm -hmm. That's one thing with your, I mean, how often do you turn Not that? ever. Yeah. Hardly ever. Yeah. I mean, we just don't have to irrigate. And, you know, we put irrigation down when we make our beds. Just in you case. can ask Bobo. We haven't installed a header. And so we get frequent rain here in mm -hmm. southeastern Virginia. We are lucky in that. Respect, um, we sure. get about 50 inches a year. Um, but because our soil is just so incredible because of caring for it mm -hmm. properly and feeding it, not with fertilizer necessarily. Um, yeah, we, we rarely have to irrigate. And that's a result of Steve's grandparents, mm -hmm. leaf molding and composting right. this land, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's all these little components pulled together. So get bringing nature home and get, I like Jessica's too, attracting beneficial bugs to your garden, a natural approach to pest control. That's a good one. That is a really, really good one. Mm -hmm. Jessica, interesting story, was a horticulturist. On drugs, which we call chemicals, drugs. Getting paid to drug other people's yards. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Getting paid. That's right. She was a dealer. <laughs> and um, then she, I forget actually what her story was. We actually did a podcast with right. her. And we will we will put a link to that podcast um, in the show notes. Jesse will. Um, she saw the light and is now this amazing, she's written multiple books right. now on okay. beneficial Good bug, bad bug. Good bug, bad bug. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was the first one. And she wrote, was the co-author of Grow Organic. Mm -hmm. Friends, you just have to, once you get in, you'll be like Rhonda and I, where you like <laughs> become a member of the bug hugging society, which is what we are. Yeah. She, we're the king and queen. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's just, it just makes it more enjoyable, grows a healthier, and it's better for the environment, the future. And everything involved. It's, and it's highly entertaining. And it's very fun. <laughs> it is very, very fun. I would say there are a couple, um, not mm -hmm. not that I don't want everybody to go out and buy books, but there are also a lot of online resources like the the, the oh, homegrown yeah. nat, um, nationalpark.org, but the Xerces Society that's oh, been yeah. around for years. They started as a butterfly to save the bu butterfly because the Xerces butterfly was wiped out when they built the Presidio in San Francisco. Yeah. It's it's extinct now. And they, so they started off trying to preserve butterflies, but now it's all invertebrates. So they're, they've got lots of great information. A lot of, um, uh, yeah, w one book is farming with uh, native beneficial insects and attracting, the one I have is attracting native pollinators. So they do a lot of stuff for not just, home gardeners but right. for farmers right and then the other one is sustainable and all these will be in the notes uh, sustainable agriculture research and education they put out a lot of information and their website is uh sare so s-a-r-e dot org and they have a lot of they do resources. have a lot they have a just following them on facebook is you, you know great articles come up and you right. see new things all the time so. facebook is far funner when you follow the right people y'all yeah, exactly isn't that the truth? I mean, people complain about certain things. I'm like, just ignore that stuff because oh. there is so much good stuff. Mm -hmm. I just go, block. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then exactly. find another one that's more fun. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great groups. And so you can really restore your natural order 
whether you live in a, how big would you say your backyard is? Mm, uh, 25 by 80. 25 by 80. <laughs> um, the double lot. Yeah. You know, I mean, doesn't matter how small your spot, if you've got a spot, a spot, you can plant something and you can mm -hmm. make a difference. Um, and so we hope this has opened your eyes. That's what our job really mm -hmm. feels because there are so many resources out there right. and we're just using them all. You know, we're just, Ron and I both have a little book problem. Um, <laughs> we love books <laughs> as much as we love bugs just about. Um, but it is awesome to be able to sit down and grab a book and look something up and it just, you fall in. That, I mean, that's a good point. The, to have a book though, one that, shows you bugs, all the insects. So you can kind of start to see like, oh, that's a, a that's an assassin bug or, oh, that's oh, a stink that's bug. So Not all stink bugs are bad. Exactly. There, there are some predatory stink bugs. So having a basic book, book like that, that kind of gets you familiar with their, their body shape, their behavior, what they do, right. what some of the characteristics are. Um, and iNaturalist is a great um, oh, app. phone app. Yeah. yeah, phone app. So you can take a picture. If it doesn't help you identify it there, you can just uh, upload it and somebody else will help you identify it. And then I like the bird one. If uh, you haven't checked out Merlin yet. The bird songs? The, yeah, you can just, it listens to them. Yeah. So you just hold it up and that's like, oh, it's a Baltimore Oriole. Yeah. Or I haven't read that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I'm not sure yeah. we will. Yeah. There are so many great resources, yeah, yeah. but to get baited, you got to start with the basics yeah. and start one's a little step, one little step at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, Rhonda, this has been fun. Mm -hmm. And um, friends, we just really wanted to wet your taste buds as we tend to do. And remember that this podcast field and garden is brought to you by the gardeners workshop.com which is what keeps us busy during the day. Um, we have a fully stocked online garden shop, online library of courses, um, tons of free resources, our podcast. You can hook up over there. We have a sister podcast called Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. And, um, you know, friends, I um, hope you'll just check those out and um, keep in the know, get on our farm news. And um, we appreciate you dropping in. Bye, Rhonda. Bye, Lisa. <laughs>